Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time with you. This time in music where we can raise our voices in praise. And now, Lord, we ask that you continue to lead us and guide us and teach us through your Holy Spirit what you want us to learn this morning. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Music's been very important um, to all of us, I'm sure. Um, my sisters are here, and uh, both of them, and they, they can remember, like I do, mom playing around the piano at our house. She played, and we would sometimes sing, and we'd sometimes play chopsticks with her and learn different things, you know, really important stuff like that. But music is important, and um, you don't realize that I think when you're growing up how important music is. We sing songs, and I can think of some of the goofy songs mom taught us to sing, and we went to Sunday school and church, and you sing there as well. Debbie and I met in music, singing in college together. You know, I was the, the she was the, the cute little one in the alto section, and I was the weird one in the tenor section, but we got together, okay? And after 54 years, we finally worked it out. I think it's okay, it's coming together. But music is really important, and that we've all listened to different kinds of music, such as these. Just sit right back and you'll hear a tale, a tale of a fateful trip. Started from this tropic board aboard this tiny ship. The mate was Some a mighty you know sailing words, man, the skipper brave and sure. Five passengers set sail that day for a three-hour tour. A three-hour tour. Split splash, I was taking the bell. Long How many of you know this song? Yeah. Rubbed up, just relaxing in the tub. kinds of music have affected our lives. And when we sing in church, we're singing a different kind of music. We're singing music to God, worshiping Him and talking about Jesus. It's so important. So this month, um, I thought I would do a series, I think it's going to be fun, a series on music that matters to God. Now, I can't say that God was all that excited about Splish Splash. <laughs> And I, you know, I've walked by a few of you this morning who probably didn't take a bath last night. Just kidding, just kidding. You're all doing fine. But I also want to kind of make this an announcement and kind of just let you know, if you don't know, many of you do, most of you do perhaps, but this is Susan York's last month with us. She's retiring. And so we're going to make it a musical month. I'm going to be preaching and talking about the word, and we're going to be singing great songs, and we'll have a whiz-bang thing for her the last Sunday of this month. It'll be kind of fun. But she's going to Virginia and she's going to watch the deer and the antelope play <laughs> and be just totally quiet, which I think is going to be a, a lot of fun. But um, music is important. And the, the first song that I picked for us to take a look at, in fact, I'm calling it What's So Amazing About Grace. And this is not a definitive Bible study on, on grace, but this is an important concept in our faith is grace. It is so important. And, you know, we're going to end with that song at the end of the service as a closing song. But for those of you who never think too much about our faith and what makes sense and what's Christianity about, maybe you have you, you stepped your toe in the water and you have a relationship with Jesus, but you've really not ever thought about how important grace is. But grace is really something that's unique to Christianity. Most religions say you have to do the following things in order to be approved by God. And God says, I have already done what is necessary. All you have to do is agree with, accept, receive what I've already done. So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about what is the grace of God. And then, like I say, end up with amazing grace at the very end. John 1.17 says, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace or charis in the Greek means favor, blessing, 
kindness. And I'm sure all of you have had an opportunity to show other people grace. Uh, maybe somebody, you know, whatever it might be, you've, you, but you've shown them kindness. You've shown other people favor. And that's, you can show grace as well. We can do that to other people. Uh, but God chose to share grace with us rather than what we deserve, which is punishment for our sins. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We don't like talking about sin. I mean, we really don't. I mean, I don't like talking about it, but it's, it's scriptural. And because of the fact that we were lost, God sent his only son. We'll talk more about that as well. There's a Gaither song that says, has the following words. I'm not going to sing it to you, but you will just see the words on the side. He came down to my level when I couldn't get up to his. With a strong arm, he lifted me up to show me what living is. He'll come down to your level if you'll open up the door. He wants to make your life worth living. That's what he came down for. I like that song. How many of you have heard the Gaither vocal band do that? Yeah, a bunch of you have. It's a great, it's a great song. Um, I've used this defi these definitions many times. I'll use them again today. Mercy and grace, two words you find throughout Scripture. But mercy is God withholding from us what we do deserve. And we all sinned and missed the mark. It's kind of like an archer. You know, sinning is kind of like an archer going for the target and he misses the mark. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. So mercy is him withholding from us what we do deserve. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve deserve, which was his son. And we all need God's grace. I'm going to take a few minutes and look through Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. So for those of you online, you can pull out your Bibles. If you have a Bible here and you want to follow along, that's fine. The uh, words will be up on the, on the screens as well. And we're going to take a look at this. Paul, <laughs> Paul knew what he was talking about. He wrote the book of Ephesians, wrote a lot of the New Testament, wrote about half the New Testament books, as a matter of fact. But Paul was a guy, as you probably know, and some of you might not know this, Paul persecuted the church as Saul. He hated Christians. He hated the, the new thing that was happening. And he would, he'd, he'd arrest them. He'd persecute them. And then after Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus met Paul on the road to Damascus. And you know where Paul was going on the road to Damascus? He's going to Damascus. <laughs> You thought that was a trick question, didn't you? Okay, there we go. <laughs> but he met him, he, he met him and he, he, like, his life was changed. Saul was no longer Saul. He became Paul, and he became a, an amazing missionary for Jesus. And he was, I mean, all the things he went through is just absolutely amazing. Don't have time to tell you about all about the life of Paul. But then he writes this, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He wrote a little bit later on when he started, you know, being a missionary and starting churches and all. He wrote to the church at Ephesus, and we read this in chapter 2, verses 1. And I, I call this part, first part here, grace needed once you were dead. This happens to be out of the NLT version. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. He's talking to the church at Ephesus. You, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. Boy, doesn't that sound like us? I mean, you know, you think about it. So I've got a, I was going to show this video this morning, but we had other things going on, and I didn't tell Debbie I wanted to do this, so I'll just explain it to you. And um, hopefully my daughter and granddaughter will not watch this particular episode. But we have a granddaughter who is now in high school, but when she was little, when she was little, her mother was feeding her peas in, you know, in the, on the high chair. And so she would get a pea and she would put it in her nose. I'm sure none of you or your kids ever did that, right? And she'd say, no, and, you know, no, ignore it. No. And so this went on for about five minutes. And I was just thinking, every time Debbie and I look at that, we say, the old sin nature. I mean, she was probably less than one. But it's the old sin nature. I'm just going to disobey. I'm going to put that pee up my nose. Well, you and I have been putting the peas up our nose, figuratively speaking, for all of our lives. And that's why we needed a Savior. And even after we come to Christ, um, how many of you be honest enough to say, once you came to Christ, that you didn't live a perfect life every day after that? <laughs> okay, because there's a few days that we mess up, okay? Two or three anyway. And that's where we then, 1 John 1, 9, the Christian's bar of soap, if you talked about that many times, if we confess our sins, 
He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That was written to Christians by John. Okay, it's the first John. And it was because we need to wash up every now and then when we have messed up. So here, again, he starts off, Paul, again, once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins. Number two, grace was given. He says, but in verse four, he says, but because of his great love for us, talking about God, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. There's that important verse. We'll talk about more of it in verse 8 in a little bit. For by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, there's that word, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God gave us grace. He poured out upon us a way to get our problem solved and to have a relationship with him. I was talking with one of our members before uh, the service started this morning. We were out there, and we were talking about heaven. And it's like, you know, and I won't ask for a show of hands, but in terms of, I know there's probably a bunch of you who says, you know, I wouldn't mind tomorrow's a good day for me to go. And I know you don't feel like that. It's not that you want to leave this world necessarily. But I think God gets, puts something in our heart where he says, you know what? I, want, I hope you have a longing to be with me. Because this is where you're going to be for a long time. Have a longing. Now, I'm not ready for, to go to heaven right this second. I am spiritually, and I hope to hang around for a long time. But if God says it's time for you to go, Jim, I'm there. I'm there. And I have a, a, we have another one of our members whose uh, daughter and I were talking, and she kind of goes, I just, you know, I just wish the Lord would just take her, take her home. She's ready to go. We get to that point, don't we? And you've all been through that, because we're, we all have friends that are a little older and have gone through stuff. My... My only concern is, number one, are you ready? If you were to get hit by a truck on the way home, are you ready? And uh, number two, uh, do you know how to help other people around you who aren't ready to meet the Lord, to help them to meet the Lord? We'll talk about that, too, as the, as the weeks go on here. So, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. Alive in Christ. I love that. Um, here's a question for you. Does your life... Is your life different than those of the people around you? Don't raise your hand. Just think about it. Is it much different? Could people tell a difference? Could your friends and family tell a difference if you had five people in a room and you're here and there somebody else? Or do you blend in? Do you look like everybody else? Or do you, or do you live differently? Hopefully, there's something different about you. Doesn't mean we don't have fun. Doesn't mean we can't party with our friends, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there should be something different about us. And we should be people of grace. We should be most thankful because of the grace that God poured out on us. So grace needed, grace given, grace received. Important verses for us. I'm sure you're all familiar with these, but I just want to kind of go through them for a couple of minutes. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Easy to say, and in most, like in the four spiritual laws that I remember getting trained in a long time ago with Campus Crusade and a lot of other, you know, salvation kind of booklet things, this is an important verse. These are important verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works. Will you say not of works with me? Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Most non-Christian religions in the world that I'm aware of all say these are the things you have to do to be approved to make it into heaven. One of the big religions, which I won't name, you'll know who I'm talking about, says you must bow and pray so many times a day facing a particular direction because you want, you want our God to be pleased with you. And if you don't do that, you won't be, he won't be pleased with you and you may not make it into everlasting life with him. Okay? And so in Christianity, we want to talk to our Lord, but we don't have to do it a certain amount of times a day. You don't have to pray every day. In fact, now, don't, don't let this out. You don't even have to come to church every Sunday to be a believer. Okay, don't let it out. Or nobody will be here next week. No, I don't, I'm not kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but grace, I guess what I'm really emphasizing is that that is different than works. Because grace says, I've done all the work. God says, I've done all the work. I'm just giving you my grace. Take advantage of what I've already done for you. You don't have to work your way to heaven. And the Americans have a tough time with this, I think, because we don't believe in getting something for nothing, do we? 
Because every time we get something for nothing, somebody else is getting nothing for something. Think that through, it'll make sense in a while. But, you know, we, don't, we believe in you get what you pay for. And so some people have difficulty with, I think, the Christian faith because we're not saying you have to pay. You don't have to join a church. You don't have to give money. Um, you should be baptized, but you don't have to be baptized to, to be a, a Christian and go to heaven when you die. Those are important things. And if you haven't been baptized, talk to me. I'd be glad to take care of it because we can do that. But, I mean, again, it's not of works. For by grace have you been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. In other words, it's not even faith of yourselves. It's a gift of God. He's given that to us, the gift of faith. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. John 1.12 says this. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believed in his name. Say children of God with me. Children of God. I won't ask you to raise your hand, but if you've accepted Jesus, you are a child of God. And you may never have said that. You may never have looked in the mirror and said, I'm a child of God. But you should. I'm a child of God. Now, um, we'll get a little personal here. How many of you have kids or grands? Okay. How many of those kids and grands occasionally do something and mess up? Okay, you have some? Okay, good. We're all in the same boat. I mean, I just told you about my little granddaughter uh, with the pee in the nose, but you know, there's other things going on with her too. <laughs> but you know what? I have, we have three daughters, and they were marvelous daughters. We love them. I mean, they're adults now, all this kind of good stuff. But they weren't perfect growing up. And you know what? When they messed up, we didn't disown them. Isn't that amazing? Anybody here disowned a kid? We need to talk. God doesn't disown you either. If you have an imperfect day, if you have an imperfect week or month or year or multiple years, God doesn't disown you. He may be disappointed in you, and he may do things to try to get you back on track, but he doesn't disown you. I don't find anything in Scripture that says, sorry, you're disowned. You know, you've lost it. Um, there are some Christian denominations who, relative, who, who actually kind of teach that, and some of you may have grown up there. I'm not going to name them. But they're like, okay, um, I've, I've become a Christian, but I've really messed up, so I've got to become a Christian again. And then I mess up, and I've got to become a Christian again. And I've got to become a Christian again. And that doesn't square with Scripture. You know, once we're born again, we are born again. I don't find any Scripture that says we're unborn. Now, in your bulletin this morning... I don't have time to get into this theological stuff, but I just wanted to kind of mention something that came out of the Reformation movement. It's called the five solas. And some of you have heard of this, and if you are in a, have gone to a high church kind of a thing in your background, you probably have heard this much more than you would in, in like a church like ours, which is a little more down to the ground, down to the earth, I guess. But solo scriptura means by scripture alone. Solo fide, by faith alone. Solo gratia, by grace alone. Solo Christo, Christ alone. Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. Those are the five solas that really made the Protestant Reformation stand out and be different from the Roman church that was going at that time. And is still going, as a matter of fact. But here we're saying by scripture alone. By scripture alone. In other words, it's not by the pastor alone, what he says, although hopefully every church you've ever attended, including this one, we're, we're grounded in the word. That's by scripture alone. So when you read this, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. That's the word of God. That's the final authority. This book is our final authority in this, in this place. Um, not the word of Jim uh, or Debbie. It's the word of God. My word doesn't mean anything. And if I stop expounding the word of God, tap me on the shoulder and say, you're done. Okay. But I continue to say this is God's word. So again, the five solos, scripture alone, by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. John 3, 16 and 17, very familiar verses, at least 16 is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you know that, say it with me or read it off the board, okay? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, that is unusual, because the heads of other religions don't give their lives for their subjects. They say, you need to serve me. And God says, I, I'm going to do something that you can't do for yourself. I'm going to send my one and only son. And then the next verse says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So a lot of people think, well, Jesus came to condemn. No, he did not. 
He came to save us. I, love, I just love that. It's, it's basic Christianity 101, but it is really important. And by the way, the reason we gave it to you out of the King James Version is that's the way I have it memorized. <laughs> Give me a different translation. It's like, I don't know the different translation, but I know King Jim. And, if it, and like my grandpa used to say, if it's good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. <laughs> he never really said that. He, I, but as a kid, that's what I thought he meant. So anyway. <laughs> Number four. Grace displayed to others, that is, good deeds and works. So good works are not bad. They're actually good. We should want to do them, but we're not saved by doing good works, not by works. Martin Luther said this, we are saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Here's what Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So when we become a Christian, again, and I want to make this real clear, we don't become a Christian by doing good works. We become a Christian by receiving Jesus Christ, our personal Lord and Savior, and you all know that. But good works should follow. And so if a person says, I've become a believer in Christ, I would expect to see something in his or her life that kind of like, well, I, you know, that's, that's great. You're, I see you serving the Lord in some way. Could be around the community. Could be within the church. Could be whatever. You're doing something. Here's what uh, James says. Faith without works is dead. And he goes on to talk about, you know, you show, me your, you show me your faith in Jesus by your faith. I'll show you by my faith and my good works. So we should have good works. There should be things in your life. Christianity should be more than a Sunday morning uh, 10 to 11 event for you. It should be like tw seven days a week we should be thinking about the Lord and talking to him and, and serving others and praying for our friends and family. Um, we have a big prayer list that we have going around. If you're, if you're a prayer and you want to pray for the folks on our prayer list, um, you can sign up for that. We're not pushing it down anybody's throat. We're not sending it to everybody. Just those people who really will sincerely pray. We have a, a prayer team that meets regularly and prays confidentially about all kinds of stuff. And that is a good work. We should be praying for one another. When you hear that we lost a, a member, you should be praying for her family um, and that kind of thing. That should, that should cross your mind regularly. And how many of you live in an area where probably within a block you've got some non-believers near you? You should be praying for them. Praying for the people next door to you if they don't know the Lord. Um, and there's some people in our neighborhood who are friends of ours who we pray for regularly. They'll come to know Christ. And I, and I encourage you to do the same thing. That's part of the good works. We need to be praying. Okay, so again, James 2.17, Faith Without Works is Dead. Now Colossians, another book written by Paul. Colossians 1, 9 to 12. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's why we come to church, to increase in the knowledge of God. That's why you read the Bible on your own. That's why you listen to devotionals by me or other people, to increase in our knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, with all patience and long-suffering, with joy, giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. There's so much there I could... I could go on for another hour just talking about these verses right here, but I won't. It's important, though, that we, you understand, but we need to be fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work. That was grace displayed to others. The next one, what's so amazing about grace? Now, grace, again, we, we all receive presents from other people, right? Sure, birthdays, maybe Christmas, maybe anniversary, something like that. And you give presents away as well. Okay, so God has given us great, he is, by his grace, he's given us eternal life or an opportunity to have our sins forgiven, have life with Jesus forever. Okay, but that grace, although it's free for us, cost him plenty. It cost him the life of his son. And you know that. And sometimes people, I think, take advantage of that. It's almost like it's cheap grace. And that's a term used by some Bible scholars and, and Bible teachers. They say, you know, I don't believe in cheap grace, which is, I'm a Christian, but I just go and do what I, I live life like I want. No, that's, that's taking advantage of God. And if you, lived, if, 
If you became a Christian on this day, and I look at you five years later, and I don't see any difference between you and a person who lives in the world and does whatever he or she does, I would have to wonder, did you get the real thing? And did you really become a Christian, or are you kind of just playing a game? And some people kind of do that. But anyway, it's a costly gift, and we've got to accept it. We've got to receive what he did and show appreciation for that. And we do that by crying out to him in praise and singing songs of worship when we start our worship service. And I've said this before, and I say it with a smile on my face, but kind of a little, little cheekiness, too. If you don't like the song service, you're not yet ready for heaven. <laughs> We're going to be doing a lot of singing in heaven. And you'll say, okay, Jim, I, my voice isn't very good. In heaven, you'll have a great voice. Yeah. And even if it's not very good here, go ahead and sing out. I mean, it's going to be fine. You'll just join everybody else whose voices left them 40 years ago, okay? <clears throat> I have some grace quotes for you this morning. Max Lucado said, The wasted years of life, the poor choices of life, God answered the mess of life with one word, grace. Karl Barth, who is a Swiss theologian and professor of New Testament, said this, Grace creates liberated laughter, the grace of God is beautiful, and it radiates joy and awakens humor. G.A. Packard, a pastor from the past, grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Jerry Bridges, who's uh, an author and speaker, and he's with the Navigators Ministry, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that, they, that you are beyond the need of God's grace. John Piper, a famous pastor. Grace is not simply leniency when we have sinned. Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power, not just pardon. Joni Erickson Tata said this, God doesn't just give us grace. He gives us Jesus, the Lord of grace. A.W. Tozer the cross is, light, is a, the lightning rod of grace that short-circuited God's wrath to Christ so that only the light of his love remains for believers. Matthew Henry, when I, was a, uh, when I was a seminary student, the first full Bible commentary I ever got was Matthew Henry. It's about this thick, kind of like my Strong's Concordance. You've got to be strong, just lift the thing up. Anyway, he said, grace is the free, undeserved goodness and favor of God to mankind. Charles Spurgeon the way you view God will eventually show up in the way you live your life. Between here and heaven, every minute that the Christian lives will be a minute of grace. From Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So let me turn a page and talk to you about the number one most popular hymn of all times, the one we'll sing this morning. If you look online for most popular hymn of all times, you get a whole bunch of different lists. And although Am uh, Amazing Grace may not be number one on all of them, it's number one on most of them, the majority. And so John Newton wrote this. He was born in 1725, before America became a, a country, officially. His mother was a Puritan, and um, she taught him the Bible and taught him songs. But unfortunately, she died when he was seven due to tuberculosis, which is, I guess, common especially back in those days. John's dad was a seaman, and so John's dad took him to sea from 11 to 17 years of age. And he learned how to be a seaman and how to cuss like a sailor. You can only imagine that. His dad had nothing to do with God, and he was just kind of a, an evil, rough kind of guy. But he got him involved, he got John involved in sea life and in shipping. John said this, Later on, he, he wrote this about those times. He said, I delighted and habitually practiced wickedness. I neither feared God nor regarded men. I'm trying to imagine a, a teenager like that. That's just amazing. At age 18, his dad got him to enlist and sign up in the Royal Navy in England. And, but uh, having had a life on a shipping uh, ship, he decided, no, I'm going to desert. I'm not going to do this. And so he deserted. They caught him, stripped him to the waist, flogged him, and uh, basically dishonorably discharged him. His life's really doing well, isn't it? His dad tried to do a variety of things with him and was unsuccessful. So, and his dad, kind of being a captain of a ship, kind of got favorite treatment for his son if he tried out on another ship. 
and he couldn't do anything with him. So he took him down to Africa, and he basically had another captain of another slave ship said, here, here's my son. I'm not protecting him. Do what you want to. He had a rough, rough life. John Newton did. So he went there. He became a, a hired hand, later worked himself up to being a captain of a slave ship, which back in those days was happening all the time. He said his cargo was typically about 200 men, women, and children, and a third of them died on the trip to England. You know, you think about that very dark, evil times. In March 1748, there was a violent storm, and John Newton was actually went back to his roots and cried out to the Lord, help me, help me, and he confessed that he had, in his prayer, that I had totally messed up. And he accepted Christ, came back, got off the, out of the shipping business, became an Anglican pastor, and uh, a born-again Christian, of course. In 1788, he wrote a 10,000-word brochure called Thoughts Upon the African Slave Trade. Now, he'd been out of it for a number of years. This is about 40 years later he wrote that. And he confessed and denounced um, the whole slave trade industry. He preached until he was 81 years old. He wrote 281 hymns. Amazing Grace, of course, is the one that we know best from him. And I, was, I wrote down this verse in my notes as I was looking at the story of him. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. None of your lives are as bad as John's apparently was. He wrote this pamphlet that I mentioned um, about thoughts upon the African slave trade where he talked about how evil it was and how bad it was. And he became friends with John and Charles Wesley, who were Methodists, um, wrote hymns with them. And also a guy by the name of William Wilberforce. How many of you heard of William Wilberforce? A bunch of you have. Very good. You're well read. Um, and he started working with William Wilberforce in England along with the Wesleys to get slavery abolished. He became an out, uh, you know, I just want to get rid of the whole slavery thing. And so in 1807, largely due to John and to Wilbur and others, um, slavery was abolished in England. And that trickled over to the United States, which then, under Lincoln, slavery was abolished there as well. His life changed amazingly. And he wrote, the, he wrote the, the words to Amazing Grace, which we'll sing in just a few minutes. And as you sing the, as you sing the song this morning, again, in a few minutes, I've got a little more I've got to talk about. But as you sing the song, think about where he came from and what he wrote and how potent that was, the words he wrote there. And maybe that's your story as well. Amazing Grace is number one in popularity for a reason. It's because I think all of us kind of go, his grace is amazing. He helped me here and here and here. He saved me. He's helped me, helped me, helped me. Grace is a five-letter word, often spelled J-E-S-U-S. -S. I want to tell you another story about grace. It was in 1987, and it was in Midland, Texas. And as soon as I mention the name of the person, you will all go, ah, this is the story of baby Jessica. Baby Jessica was just 18 months old, and she fell down a well in her aunt's backyard that was about eight inches in diameter. I'm hard, it's hard for me to imagine how uh, a toddler could fall down that hole, but somehow she did. She was upright, but she had a foot that was up above her head, and she was stuck. She was 22 feet down below the grade, grade level, 22 feet down in an eight inch pipe. And it became a worldwide phenomenon as they looked at the news. It took them 56 hours to extricate her from that. They had to drill a, down. They got a guy who, had, who was born without collarbones. And because of that, he could really squish himself down. He went down the hole, not the same when she went down the parallel hole, and drilled across, brought out a fascinating story, 56 hours. Um, in her life, she's had 15 surgeries. When she got out, they, the doctors thought they were going to have to um, amputate a foot. But they gave her some hyperbaric treatments, and they only had to take off a toe, which is nice. But here's, here's the, uh, the bottom line, or here's the end of the story. She's now 38 years old, is married, has two kids. Has no memory, other than what she reads in history, has no memory of that event. 
baby Jessica. That to me is a story of grace as well. Um, Heavenly Father, thank you for the grace you pour out upon us. Thank you. It is amazing. We don't deserve it, but you poured out on us because you loved us and you care about us. And Father, as we sing these verses, some of which will be new to the folks, I just really pray you'll let the meaning soak into our spirits and into our thinking. And may we forever be thankful for your amazing grace to us. Amen.